Aratus is an island three or four miles from the mainland. It contains an old shrine of Aphrodite. The woman lived there as in a house, feeling completely secure. Calerho stood in front of Aphrodite, looking at her. At first she said nothing but wept. Her tears reproached the goddess. Then she managed to find her voice. So now it is Aratus, a small island of Great Sicily, and there is no one here of my own people. My lady, that is enough. How long are you going to be at war with me? I may really have given you offense, but you have punished me for it. Perhaps my ill-starred beauty evoked your indignation, but it has been my ruin. Now I have experienced the one misfortune I had never known war. Compared to my present situation, even Babylon was charitable to me. There Charius was near at hand. Now he is assuredly dead. He would not have stayed alive when I left the city. But I do not know for whom I can find out what has happened to him. All are strangers to me. All are foreigners. They envy me. They hate me. And worse than those who hate me are those who love me. My lady, reveal to me whether Charius is alive. With these words on her lips, she went away. Rodogune came to her to comfort her. She was the daughter of Zalpyrus and the wife of Megabizus. Both father and husband were Persian nobles. She had been the first Persian woman to meet Kalerho on her entry into Babylon. When the Egyptian heard that the king was close and he had made preparations both on land and at sea, he called Charius to him and said, I have not had the chance to reward you for your first success, putting Tyre into my hands, but I ask you to help me with the next stage. We must not lose the advantages we now possess, which I shall share with you. I am satisfied with Egypt. Syria shall be yours. We must consider what to do. The war is at its height in both elements. I give you the choice. You command the land or the naval forces whichever you wish. I think you will feel more at home on the sea. You Syracusans overcame even Athenians at sea. Today it is the Persians you are fighting, and they were beaten by the Athenians. You have the Egyptian warships available. They are bigger than the Sicilian ships, and there are more of them. Do as your kinsman Hermocrates did at sea. Any danger is sweet to me replied Charius. I will undertake this war for you, and also against the king, who is my detested enemy. But along with the warships, give me my three hundred men as well. Take them, said the king, and as many more as you want along with them. These words were at once translated into action. The need was pressing. So the Egyptian made ready to meet the enemy with the infantry, while Charius was appointed admiral. The infantry were at first somehow discouraged that Charius was not in their ranks, because he had now won their affection, and they were full of optimism if he was to lead them. So it was as if a great body had an eye removed. On the other hand, the navy's morale rose high. They were filled with frightening spirit at the thought that having the bravest and finest of men their commander. No ignoble thought entered their minds. Captains, helmsmen, crew, marines all set out eager to see who would be the first to display to Charius his zealous devotion. Battle was joined on land and sea the same day. For a long, long time, the Egyptian infantry held out against the Medes and Persians. Then they were overwhelmed by sheer numbers and gave in. The king rode after them. The Egyptians tried hard to effect an escape to Pelusium. The Persians were eager to catch them before they got there. The Egyptians might actually have got away had not Dionysius produced a remarkable achievement. He performed brilliantly in the engagement, always fighting near the king so as to catch his eye, and was the first to rout those ranged against him. 
Now, when the retreat proved a long one, with no respite, night or day, he saw that the king was worried by that. Don't worry, sir, he said. I will stop the Egyptians from getting away if you give me some picked cavalry. Cavalry. The king commanded him and gave him cavalry. He took 5,000 men and completed two days' journey in one day. He fell on the Egyptians unexpectedly at night, took many of them prisoner, and killed more. The Egyptian king, who was going to be taken alive, killed himself. Dionysius took his head back to the king, who, when he saw it, said, I shall list you as a benefactor to my house. Here and now I give you the most pleasing of gifts, one that you yourself desire above all others. I grant you, Kalerho, to be your wife. The war has decided the case. You have the finest possible prize for your brave deeds. Dionysus made obeisance. He counted himself the equal of the gods, for he was convinced that he was now firmly established as Kalerho's husband. That was what happened on land. At sea, Charius was victorious. The enemy fleet was no match for him at all. They could not take the ramming of the Egyptian triremes and would not face head-on attacks at all. Some of them turned tail immediately. Others were forced to shore, and Charius captured them all, crews and all. The sea was full of shipwrecked Median vessels, but the king did not know about the defeat of his own naval forces. Equally, Charius did not know about the Egyptian defeat on land. Each thought his own side had been victorious in both elements. So, on the day of his victory, Charius sailed to Aratus to put in there. He ordered his fleet to circle round the island and keep it under surveillance, to report in person to their master. They collected the eunuchs and maidservants and all the less valuable personnel into the town square, which offered an extensive area. There were so many there that they spent the night not only in colonnades, but in the open air. Some of them, th those of some value, they took into a building in the square where the town council usually transacted its business. The woman sat on the ground around the queen. They neither lit a fire nor ate any food. They were convinced that the king had been captured, that Persia was ruined, and that the Egyptians had won everywhere. That night, both ecstasy and misery held Aratus in their grip. The Egyptians were glad to be rid of war and enslavement to Persia. The Persian prisoners were expecting chains, whipping, humiliation, slaughter, and the kindest fate of all, enslavement. Tatira laid her head in Kalerho's lap and wept. Kalerho, like a cultivated Greek woman with her own experience of sorrow, did her best to comfort the queen. What happened was as follows. An Egyptian soldier, who had been given the job of guarding the people in the building, discovered that the queen was inside. Given the innate superstition that barbarians feel toward the royal title, he could not bring himself to approach her, but he stood by the closed door and said, Do not be afraid, my lady. At present, the admiral does not know that you too have been shut up here with the prisoners. But when he finds out, he will look after you kindly. He is not only brave, but he will make you his wife. He has a liking for women. When she heard that, Kalerho broke out in loud lamentation and tore her hair. Now I really am a prisoner. Slay me, but do not make me such a promise. Marriage I cannot endure. I pray rather for death. They can torture me. Goads and fire will not make me rise from here. This spot is my tomb. If your commander is as kind as you say, let him grant me this favor. Let him kill me here. The Egyptian renewed his pleas, but she refused to get up. Rather, she sank to the floor and lay there, her head covered. The Egyptian had to consider what to do. He could not bring himself to use force, but on the other hand, he could not persuade her to do as he said. So he went back to Charius with a gloomy expression. When he saw him, Charius said, What has happened now? Are there people stealing the best of the spoils? They won't get away with it. There is no harm done, sir, replied the Egyptian. 
It is that woman. I found her lying on the floor. She refuses to come. She has thrown herself on the ground. She is asking for a sword to kill herself with. Charius laughed. What a fool you are, he said. Don't you know how to deal with a woman? Appeal to her. Flatter her. Make promises to her. Above all, let her think she is loved. You probably tried to force her to come and treated her harshly. No, sir, I didn't, he said. I have done everything you said. I've gone a lot farther. I've taken your name in vain and said you would marry her. And that made her angrier than ever. What a charming, irresistible man I must be, said Charius. If she rejects me and hates me before she has even seen me, she seems to be a woman of dignity. No one is to offer her violence. Let her do as she pleases. Self-respect deserves my respect. Perhaps she is mourning a husband herself.